and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. Prince Charles has delivered the Queen's speech on behalf of his mother, outlining the government's plans for this parliament. We'll have reaction from MPs from the three main parties and our royal and political correspondents too. Plus, we're talking cost of living with Shadow Work and Pension Secretary Jonathan Ashworth and asking the Mirror's Kevin Maguire about Keir Starmer's big gamble. A smart move or a foolish mistake? First, it's your news with Rosie. Very good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Prince Charles has delivered the Queen's speech for the first time, setting out the legislative agenda for the government. He said the government's priority is to address the cost of living crisis and to pledge new powers for the police force as he delivered the Queen's speech in place of the 96-year-old monarch. Well, the Queen missed the state opening of Parliament for the first time in almost 60 years. Buckingham Palace said she had mobility issues. MPs will debate the Queen's speech later today. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. Her Majesty's government will level up opportunity in all parts of the country and support more people into work. In these challenging times, Her Majesty's government will play a leading role in defending democracy and freedom across the world. The Labour Party claims to be confident it can prove Sir Keir Starmer did not break lockdown rules last year. In an event now dubbed Beer Gate, sources say they've compiled WhatsApp chats and videos to show that the event in question last year in April was a work function. Sir Keir says if he's fined for the gathering, he'd do the right thing. Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen told GB News he thinks the Prime Minister and the Labour leader should be treated equally. Keir Starmer was in real danger of being eaten by a monster that he'd actually created himself by calling for Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak to resign just for being under investigation. For me, what we need to do is we need to have investigators who are investigating Partygate to go up there and oversee that investigation in Durham so that we have consistency mm. of application of the law. The United Nations is warning the number of civilians killed in Ukraine is thousands higher than its official toll of 3,381. It's after the southern port city of Odessa was bombarded overnight by Russian missiles, destroying a number of buildings, including a shopping centre. Ukraine's armed forces say at least one person has been killed and five injured. President Zelensky says it's the first time the port's been attacked since the Second World War. Without our agriculture exports, dozens of countries in different parts of the world are already on the brink of food shortages. Politicians are already discussing the possible consequences of the price crisis and famine in African countries and Asian countries. This is a direct consequence of Russian aggression, which can only be overcome together by all Europeans, by the whole free world. It can be overcome by putting pressure on Russia by effectively forcing Russia to stop this shameful war. In Sri Lanka, at least five people have died and around 200 injured following protests. Thousands of demonstrators in the capital, Colombo, attacked government figures and set ablaze homes and shops that belong to politicians. It's as the country faces what's being called the worst economic crisis in their history. The country's Prime Minister, Mahindra Rajpuksa, has resigned following the clashes. No arrests have been made. An inquiry into the death of a man who was restrained by police in Fife gets underway today. Sheikh Bayou, who's been described by his family as Scotland's George Floyd, died seven years ago while in police custody. A central part of the inquiry will be deciding whether race played a factor in his death. The High Court has heard Rebecca Vardy had no choice but to bring the libel claim against Colleen Rooney. It's been called Wagatha Christie, the long-awaited libel trial between two wives of two former England football players, Jamie Vardy and Wayne Rooney. Miss Vardy says she wants to establish her innocence and vindicate her reputation. 
Mrs Rooney accused Mrs Vardy of leaking false stories about her to the media. That is something Mrs Vardy denies. A painting described as a modern Mona Lisa has become the most expensive work by a US artist to be sold at auction. It's Andy Warhol's iconic image of Marilyn Monroe that went under the hammer for a record £158 million. Shot Sage Blue Marilyn was originally described by Warhol as the ultimate depiction of his ultimate muse. You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head to the briefing with Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, Prince Charles has delivered the Queen's speech in Parliament. Outlining the government's legislative plans will bring you reaction from MPs, from the three main parties and from our political correspondent too. It's only the third time in her entire reign that the Queen hasn't delivered the speech. Our royal reporter Cameron Walker will update us from Windsor. I'll talk later with Shadow Work and Pension Secretary Jonathan Ashworth about the soaring cost of living after the shocking report that two million adults are skipping meals. And Labour leader Keir Starmer has pledged to quit if he receives a police fine. Is that a smart political move or a foolish mistake? I'll ask the Mirror's Associate Editor, Kevin Maguire. Prince Charles has delivered the Queen's speech for the first time. Dozens of new bills have been announced, with the government promising to tackle the cost of living crisis and crack down on disruptive protests. Well, joining me to unpack what was in it was uh, and what was missing from it, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by MPs from the three main parties. Pauline Latham, Conservative MP for Mid Derbyshire, Anna McMoran, Labour MP for Cardiff North and Shadow Victims Minister, and Vera Hobhouse, Liberal Democrats MP for Bath. Welcome, ladies. Uh, by the way, I should say we didn't do this on purpose, but it is wonderful that we have an all female MPs panel uh, today. Um, Pauline, representing the government side of the House, what did you like about the Queen's speech and did you feel that anything was missing from it? Yes, I mean, clearly there's always going to be something missing, but what I liked was the energy um, bill that will be coming in, particularly as Rolls-Royce uh, in Derby, in my constituency, will be at the forefront of the nuclear, the small modular reactors. So that is a really important part to move that forward. Uh, I'm also really pleased to see, also coming from Derby, with Derby County's problems at the EFL, there will be a new regulatory body. It won't do anything for Derby, but it will help so save other clubs in the future. So I'm really pleased about that. What I was disappointed in, though, was we haven't got the animal welfare bill, and I'm concerned particularly about trophy hunting, uh, the imports of trophy hunting, and I'm really would, if I get a, a private member's bill, I would take that through, regardless whether the government want it, I would do that, because it's very important. And just give us a, a, a one or two line explanation, if you would, on trophy hunting. What, what is it? Trophy hunting is where people go out to uh, kill innocent, uh, endangered species like lions, and what's happening is lions' brains are getting smaller because they're killing the largest with the biggest manes. And the same with elephants. We are losing the older animals. It's not just about endangered species who cannot pass on their knowledge to the younger animals in their grouping. And that's really important. If we can stop them importing the trophies into this country or transitioning through this country, it will make a difference. And it will set an example. Thank you, Pauline. And now to go to the opposition's parties. Um, Anna, did you like anything? <laughs> Come on, I know it's hard for opposition parties, but the same question to you. What did you like and what did you feel was missing? Well, look, um, what's very clear is we've had 12 years of a Conservative government. And we're seeing an economic downturn. We're seeing uh, high inflation. We're seeing high taxes. And we're seeing people across the country really struggling, suffering from the cost of living crisis that we are all seeing, all experiencing. And although Johnson touts this in that speech, there is clearly nothing there to address it. You know, as opposed to Labour, who would bring in a windfall tax on the main oil and gas companies, the ones that are announcing record billion pound profits. We need to come up with something. 
Johnson needs to come up with something to help people up and down the country. I think also there was no mention of a victims bill. Right, now so this is, shadow victims uh, as shadow victims minister, we are seeing, uh, we've seen now six years of government after government announce it. I'm actually quite shocked that it wasn't in there. Now, victims are being let down with the justice system time and time again. Criminals are being let off the hook. We need to see something in there to, that puts victims right at the heart of the justice system. And just in one or two lines, just tell me the practical impact of a victim's bill. What, what does it mean? It means that you put victims' rights first, so that if you are the victim of a crime, uh, you will know, you will be told what is going to happen to your perpetrator to well, making sure that more rapists are locked up, more uh, criminals are locked up, but most importantly, that that victim comes first so that they know what happens from day one of reporting the crime to right through to the very end of it. We haven't seen anything. And this is 12 years of a Conservative government shamefully letting victims down, letting criminals off the hook, and most importantly, just destroying our communities because of it. Vera, welcome to the studio. We've talked a lot remotely. It's really nice of you to um, come into the studio. It's nice to see you in, in, in the flesh. Um, did you like anything in the Queen's speech? What do you think was missing? Well, there was certainly more missing than there was in it that was useful from what we think would help struggling families with the cost of living crisis. But to create a little bit of cross-party support, I absolutely support Pauline um, and um, her private members bill if it comes forward um, to ban trophy hunting. It's absolutely necessary. There's cross-party support for it, so why is the government not supporting it? And in, in the same way, um, the victim's bill is, uh, is, is absolutely necessary. But um, there are other things that are missing. For example, you know, why are up and down the country people struggling with ambulance waiting times. Mm. Um, and, and, and there is uh, my colleague Daisy Cooper, who has um, put forward a private member's bill to tackle that particular problem, which affects everybody. And it's, you know, people are dying on trolleys if we are not making sure that we, we do something about it. Another one is um, the private member's bill from Tim Farron about uh, stopping water companies to dumping raw sewage into our rivers. That um, is, is something that absolutely needs to be urgently tackled. And last but not least, I've put forward um, a bill um, um, about the government reporting back on rape conviction rates. You know, again, unless we are actually tackling that, only 1% um, of um, rape uh, uh, gets actually ends up um, to where we have a, a conviction. Many more go unreported and many fail in the court. So why is that? How can we, t can we tackle that? Why is the government not taking that much more seriously? We're going to chat much more, but first of all, let's cross live to our royal reporter, Cameron Walker, who is at Windsor. Cameron, a Queen's speech, but not as we know it. No, not as we know it, Gloria. It was a bit of a historic day, actually. Prince Charles reading the Queen's speech for the first time, sat next to the imperial state crown, a, a symbol that, you know, symbolises uh, the sovereignty of the monarch. Uh, and uh, as we know, Her Majesty announced last night that she would not be attending uh, the state opening of parliaments today. And that's because of what the palace called uh, episodic, episodic mobility problems. And I think to you or I, that means she has good days and perhaps some bad days with her health. Some days are better than others. So she handed over responsibility to two of her councillors of state, that is Prince Charles and Prince William, who jointly have the power uh, to open a new session of Parliament. Uh, the Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla, was also there. She is a privy councillor and future Queen consort. Uh, but the Queen maintains a busy diary still. She has lots of engagement. She had a call with Australia yesterday. She has a virtual privy council meeting tomorrow, as well as a call with the Prime Minister and perhaps some virtual engagements next week. So she's very much not uh, putting her feet up just yet. She's still our head of state, head of the armed forces uh, and head of the Church of England. But she is 96 and no doubt uh, Palisades are very much hoping that she will be um, a, a available for the Platinum Jubilee celebrations in just a couple of weeks' time. And so say all of us. Cameron, thank you. Thank you. And just on that, and, I, and I'll start with you, Anna, we all know what the Palace of Westminster is like, um, but viewers won't have the sense of how difficult it would be to navigate if you do have mobility issues. Absolutely. It, it is actually, it's a, it's a place that's not fit for purpose for many, many people. 
um, <clears throat> able-bodied people, fine, but any sort of issues, um, any at taking in of young children, anything, it is old-fashioned. It's a palace. Yeah. Uh, that's what you get with a palace. It's, it is falling down. It is in desperate need of repair, and it, it is not fit for a modern-day democracy, I'm afraid to say. And do, just to you, Vera, do you like all the pomp and the ceremony of the Queen's speech? Well, I certainly think um, the UK is very, very special of having um, a historic palace like this, that is still a working palace. So we are privileged and it, it, it is, um, you know, obviously uh, quite uplifting and celebratory to be in a surrounding like that. But at the same time, uh, we need to be um, moving into the 21st century and be inclusive and make sure that people actually have access to it. Um, also those who work um, on a day-to-day -day basis in, in Westminster. So it is a difficult balance. It will cost a lot of money to restore. Um, and um, it, it really is uh, for the public to understand that if we want to have this very special place, it costs a lot of money and it will cost a lot of ta taxpayers' money to bring it into the 21st century. Is it in the 21st century, the Queen's speech? Yes, I think so, because it is a very important occasion when the government sets out what it's going to do. So if we don't have... If we just have somebody reading it in the House of Commons, that, that won't mean the same. It is great, and we do do pomp and ceremony very well in this country, and I normally sit in the Royal Gallery to watch the parade go through, and it's a wonderful occasion, and I, I don't want to dumb down these wonderful occasions. I want to preserve those, because we've got the most splendid building albeit it needs a lot of repair, but we don't want to lose that because then you lose quite a lot of the atmosphere of Parliament and it's one of those occasions where everybody wants to be there, everybody wants to see it, we can take a few guests and I think that's absolutely amazing. But it is a difficult place to navigate if you have mobility problems. It really is. And, Polly, I'm going to stick with you because both of the opposition MPs, they talked about uh, the cost of living um, that, and, and, the, and the hurt that people are, mm. are suffering right now. Um, in the Sun newspaper today, it's speculated that perhaps the Prime Minister could bring forward that income tax cut or cut VAT on energy bills or make the £200 loan a grant. Are you hopeful that there is going to be something to ease the pain that everybody is going through at the moment? Yes, and it, it wouldn't be in the Queen's speech in that it wouldn't be an act or a bill. It would be Rishi Sunak's, um, when he comes and announces to Parliament, his measures. I would like to see income tax going down. I also would like to see that £200 loan made into a gift because it's just going to be very complicated and very expensive for companies to recover it. And that will negate... We must well just give the money to the people who need it. But not everybody needs it. We don't need to give it to everybody. But for those who do, it's, it is going to be an important lifeline. But bringing down income tax it always shows that there's a bigger income tax take. So it's, I would have thought, in the Chancellor's interest to reduce income tax. Very good. Um, Let's we, we meet after after the local elections uh, last week. So I'm going to ask each of you for your honest assessment of where you did well and where the challenges uh, remain. And I'm going to start with Vera from the Liberal Democrats. Well, we did fabulously well. We were the biggest net um, uh, uh, gainers in councillors across the country. Uh, we are really, really back, uh, and we um, always make a particular point about local government. It's very important for us. We are the best local champions. So I'm, I'm massively pleased about the progress you have, we have made, particularly, of course, in the southwest. Um, we took Somerset Council. Uh, a shame it's become a unitary council. It's, it's um, away from county and district councils. To me, that is, uh, you know, a, a, a ruthless undermining of local democracy um, that was done by the Tory government and, you know, the Conservatives um, deserve no better that they have not now lost the council. So um, there is a bit of, uh, a, you know, a, a, a real joy that we have managed to take that council. But I regret um, that we've gone away from more local um, democracy in, in Somerset. But across the country, we have really shown we've taken Hull City Council, we can win against the Tories. And if I may say, um, also to take um, seats from Labour, it's important for us to, to really show that, you know, we are everywhere and um, therefore I'm very, very proud of my party. 
other Liberal Democrats can be taking some of your colleagues' seats at the next election. Tell us your honest assessment of how those local elections well, go for you. It was very patchy. We knew London was going to be difficult, but in my area, Derby City lost three seats. Yeah. But next door in Amber Valley, they, we gained two seats. So yeah. it was incredibly patchy. And it wasn't that the people in Derby hadn't done the work. They had. They'd worked really hard. But it is a difficult one at the moment. We have been in power for 12 years, uh, albeit five as a coalition. And I think people just get a bit fed up with the governing party and they want to change things. But I don't think it was a big enough change in my area um, to say, you know, we shouldn't carry on as we are. But I would like to have seen us gaining more, more obviously. Anna, to you. I mean, I am incredibly proud of how we did in those local elections. Um, in Wales, we have now no, no Conservative local councils at all. And that is an absolute historic win in Monmouthshire. We won back Monmouthshire. Yeah. So, um, but across the country, we made historic gains. And I think that really goes to show the people have spoken. We went into these local elections with some very, very clear uh, statements about demanding a, an emergency budget to address the cost of living crisis. People have spoken. They want change. And I think we are on course to win the next general election. Oh, I could, I could, I could come back up, uh, all of your, you on your, on your party's assessments, but um, I won't. Instead, we're going to go live now to our political correspondent, Tom... Oh, no, we are not, but we will talk to him uh, shortly. Um, right, OK, let's talk to... In fact, I'm going to start with you, Polly. Um, Keir Starmer, quite a, a, a big uh, call that he made uh, yesterday. Some say that is a mark of integrity, that he said if he, if he got a police fine, he would resign from the leadership of the Labour Party. Critics say unfair political pressure on Durham police to not fine him. Where do you stand? I think that's right. He has put huge pressure on Durham police. I actually think it should be the same people that did the investigation in London over the so-called party gate. This is now Curry Gate. And I think we need some consistency and we need somebody to go and look who's got a, a different eye. It is difficult for Durham now because they have been put under pressure. But Keir Starmer has said all along it was not a party. It's just as much a party as anything that happened in Downing Street. And I think he should... Well, he has um, said he will resign. But when Boris Johnson and when Rishi Sunak were being investigated, he said, you should resign whilst you're being investigated. So why hasn't he? I mean, it's double standards. Anna, double I mean, standards. you couldn't get to more polar opposite people. Keir Starmer, a man of absolute integrity, decency, honesty, really showing that in his statement yesterday. We all know that in Labour. But I think he has gone further and shown the country that he is a man of integrity. Uh, and this is compared to and draws a huge line between him and our Prime Minister, who I'm afraid has lying in his DNA. We need a Prime Minister who has that honesty and integrity. And Keir Starmer has shown that. Um, Vera, over uh, to you. Um, a sign of integrity, Keir Starmer's Stam decision yesterday, or putting undue pressure on, on Durham police? Well, what the last many months have now shown is no politician can be above the law. So it is right uh, that Keir Starmer gets investigated and the police um, has the freedom to really thoroughly investigate um, whether this was outside or inside the rules. So um, Keir Starmer has made a decision of what he will do subsequently, and that is his decision. I think it contrasts absolutely uh, with the behaviour of the Prime Minister, who has been trying to dug out, trying to blame other people, um, uh, and, 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 and really been, been dishonest with us uh, in Parliament about his behaviour. And therefore, yes, um, there is definitely a contrast to the current Prime Minister, uh, and let's wait and see what happens. Well, I think we can now go live to our political correspondent, Tom Howard, who is on College Green, which is... Oh, forgive, forgive me, <laughs> forgive me, we can't. So, <laughs> this is um, a reset. 
this, Boris, the Prime Minister, will want this to be a reset yeah. moment for the government. We've, they've, it's been a bit of a Tory time for your party. There's been, yes. you know, with various um, rows and um, scandals and fine, fines. Um, is it enough to reset the course? I think it can be. It's a lot of bills to get through in a short space of time and when we've got two, two and a bit years and there's a lot of bills there with a lot of meat on them. So I think it is a reset and I think we do need to say COVID has finished, we put that behind us, let's move on to the things that really are important to people's everyday lives, including, for instance, the mental health uh, bill that's going to come forward. We need more support for people with mental health, right from children right through to old age and dementia. There needs to be more support for patients in that situation. So there's lots of things that the government are thinking about doing, and I think it's very positive, and we, because we do need to just get on with the job that we were elected to do. Anna, uh, tough on protesters causing disruption, making more of Brexit opportunities, more on levelling up. What's not to like? Well, look, a lot of this is a desperate attempts at political spin because this is a prime minister who knows that he's on the ropes. And these are an attempt at bills to distract across the country. But nothing is going to distract people from how they're living day to day and the struggles that they are in. We haven't seen anything substantial. We need an emergency budget. We need substantial policies to address the cost of living crisis. But we also need to address the climate emergency. We're not seeing any, anywhere near enough uh, legislation come through to really address that crisis that we are facing. Leveling up across the country is needed. This is more leveling down. Vera, to you. I mean, tough on protesters causing disruption, I, I reckon that'll be pretty popular. Well, th this is a direct undermining of our civil liberties um, and our right to protest. So, you know, it, it comes to you and you want to protest about something and we've got that right. And that is a sign um, of a mature democracy that people can have their say. And the um, a Conservative government has been uh, ruthless in undermining our civil liberties. It's not OK. It's anything but OK. Uh, it's trying to distract from a government that is rotten to the core. They are losing increasingly, the Conservatives, um, their support in their traditional areas. That has Two by-elections have shown that. The le uh, recent local elections have shown that. So... People are looking for decency and they're also um, actually standing by our British values. The right to protest is very much part of our British values and of our democracy. So I don't know what they're up to. Uh, it's bad. Great to chat to you all. Great to have an all-women panel. Enjoy the, the humorous speeches yes. this afternoon because, I mean, although the Commons, uh, the bar for humour in the Commons may be slightly lower than you'd get at a comedy club, it is, it is quite... <laughs> It's uh, you get some fun speeches, yeah, for the Commons. For <laughs> okay, nice to see all of you. Pauline from the Conservatives, Anna from Labour, Vera from the Liberal Democrats. Thank you for your assessments. Next, we're talking about the loyal address. Do you know what it is? We're talking to someone who's given it before the Conservative peer, Lord Richard Benyon. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. <laughs> That's brazier Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. 
We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good afternoon, it is 12.30. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. Prince Charles has delivered the Queen's speech for the first time, setting out the legislative agenda for the government. He said their priority is to address the cost of living crisis and to pledge new powers for the police force. He delivered the Queen's speech in place of the 96-year-old monarch. She missed the state opening of Parliament for the first time in almost 60 years. Buckingham Palace said the Queen had mobility issues. MPs will debate the speech later. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. Her Majesty's government will level up opportunity in all parts of the country and support more people into work. In these challenging times, Her Majesty's government will play a leading role in defending democracy and freedom across the world. The United Nations is warning the number of civilians killed in Ukraine is thousands higher than its official toll of 3,381. It's after the major port city of Odessa was bombarded overnight by Russian missile strikes. The country's armed forces say at least one person has been killed and five have been injured. Ukraine's president is warning of global food shortages after the attack. The High Court has heard Rebecca Vardy had no choice but to bring the libel claim against Colleen Rooney. Dubbed Wagatha Christie, the long-awaited libel trial between the wives of the former England football players Jamie Vardy and Wayne Rooney is underway. Mrs Vardy says she wants to establish her innocence and vindicate her reputation. Mrs Rooney had accused Mrs Vardy of leaking false stories about her to the media. That's something Mrs Vardy denies. You're up to date on GB News. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Gloria with the briefing. Down the line, because we don't have an earpiece sorted yet. We can now go to our political correspondent, Tom Howard, who is on College Green next to Parliament. Tom... Is this a reset moment for the government? Well, that's certainly what the Prime Minister is hoping this will be. Of course, the government trying to set out this new expansive agenda to push forward through not just this year, but also set course for, of course, the expected general election in potentially 2024. This, in many ways, is the last big opportunity that the government has to set out its defining mission of levelling up to try and do the big structural changes to deal with the cost of living down the line. Of course, no immediate measures that will will help people in their pockets uh, were announced today, but we are expecting there may be, there's a lot of speculation, there may be a fiscal event in the coming weeks or months from the Chancellor that would do that. Now, this is about 38 bills that will be before Parliament over the course of this session, trying to define exactly what it is this government is doing. Let's not forget this government has been uh, rather disrailed over the last two years, of course, after winning that historic victory mere months into uh, the Prime Minister's premiership. Uh, the world was hit by Covid and the pandemic has been the defining course of this government so far. Well, with that mostly now in the rearview mirror, will the government be able to 
create a new sense of purpose for itself, building back from the pandemic and pushing forward with an agenda for growth and for jobs and for structural reform, rebalancing of the economy here across the UK. That's the real challenge that the government has got. And over the coming days, weeks and indeed months, there'll be a lot of scrutiny for the proposed legislation that has been set out today. Tom, thank you. Don't go anywhere. Uh, now, one of the many quirks of the state opening of Parliament is the great day for parliamentary nerves. It's what's known as the loyal address. It's a speech given by a backbench MP on the governing side of the House, thanking the Queen for her speech. And it's often rather humorous. Uh, Tom is now going to speak to someone who's given a loyal address himself back in 2017, Lord Benyon, who was at the time simply known as Richard Benyon, the MP for Newbury. Here he is in 2017. Tom, you have Richard Benyon, the Lord Richard Benyon, who, when he was a Member of Parliament, gave what is known as the Loyal Address. I read that speech this morning, lots of humour in it. I know you've got Richard there with you. Yes, I've got Richard with me right now. And, of course, the Loyal Address is something really important and a, a significant moment, of course, uh, in our politics. So, Richard, uh, firstly, let's, let's talk about your Loyal Address a few years ago. Um, how did you get chosen to be the one to deliver it? I was just rung by the Chief Whip. And there, there are two. That, that it is proposed by a sort of what's called a senior backbencher. That is ruder words for that. And, uh, and then seconded by a young up-and-coming -com person. I was the old codger um, doing the first speech. Uh, and I, it's, it's an event which is usually laced with humour and uh, self-deprecating if possible. Um, but unfortunately, that was just after the 2017 election when my party was in a state of, uh, of nervous anticipation of a hung parliament. Uh, we had just had Grenfell and we just had two terror attacks. So it was, it was hard to inject humour into an event like that. And of course, Joe Cox's murder not long before that. No, a very, very tough time. And I, I suppose there have been really torrid times uh, since then as well. Parliament has been uh, not the most stable of mm. places in the intervening years. Do you think we've now reached a moment where there can be a bit more mirth? Well, I, I, I hope so. Uh, you know, you've got to keep politics... Uh, understandable to people in real life and at times we get very the Westminster village you know, it can be very contained uh, its own linguistics its own traditions and we've got to be approachable but uh, uh, you know it was uh, it was an interesting uh, occasion to do it and I, I, I it now what now sounds breathtakingly naive I said come on this is a chance for us to all work together we may not have supported Brexit or we may have supported Brexit uh, but we've got to make this work. We're the fifth biggest economy in the, in, the, in the world. Let's have a bit more of a belief in this place than, uh, you know, Britons tend to beat ourselves up at uh, times like this. And actually abroad, they think we're great and we need a bit of that. And so I try to inject a bit of that. It sounds now, in, in hindsight, breathtakingly naive. Oh, I suppose you wish that people had listened to you more assiduously rather than just in good humour. Uh, if you were delivering the address today, would you strike a different tone? I think that politics has become pretty unpleasant. And uh, I think that Joe Cox's line, I quoted it twice now, is that there's more that unites us than divides us, is something of its time now. Uh, and... You know, I hope that the tone of the speeches today in both houses reflects that we live in a massive global problems. We, you, you talked a moment ago about the world of impact of COVID. We now have a global economic uh, headwinds, to, to, which is going to make real difference to people's lives. Uh, and I think people are looking for politics to be a little bit more mature, a bit more consensual, and uh, with a clear sense of purpose that those people that they are representing really being at the heart of our decision making. It's interesting talking about the loyal addresses. These, this is, it's a long, it's a long-standing tradition that uh, I, I, I don't know the origins of well, it. I, actually, Do, could you speak to that? Well, I, I can a bit because my, I sound like a, a, a you know, I, I'm here because of, uh, of ancestry. I'm not, but um, my great-great-grandfather was asked by Disraeli to propose the loyal address, and he 
politely refused because he never spoke in Parliament as a matter of principle. And uh, I, when I tell that to parliamentarians today, particularly I told it to what, a speaker, and he said, I wish there were more like him today. <laughs> but there's no record of him ever making a speech. But it was, it was a tradition that a, an established backbencher on the government side always proposed the law address. It was seconded by a government backbencher. And then you get into the meat of the Queen's speech debate. And uh, so it's a tradition, but and, it has also was it always Was it always meant to be funny, or is that something that just sort of came about? I, I, it's a very good question. I don't know when, when humour... I did look at a whole lot of uh, speeches that have been made back in history, and there was quite a lot of humour. You're supposed to talk about your constituency, and I made another great mistake, which, which I, I was trying to make a good Conservative One Nation uh, thing about there being deprivation, you know, everywhere, even in uh, as, uh, communities that are to all the the eye looks very affluent and I said you know some people say that Newbury is an area where uh, you know, deprivation is when Waitrose runs out of balsamic vinegar and I then went on to say but that of course is not the case there are people there really suffering but in social media they just sliced that bit and I looked like I was sort of you know um, you know Marie Antoinette yeah, so I but, uh, but, but it, I think it is important that we do have humor lightheartedness and that ability what people often don't understand is how much working goes across the floor mm different parties and certainly in the Lords we have to compromise a lot because no party has a majority so I think people want to see a bit of that. Yes a bit more uh, collaboration in politics potentially that's what today might be more about well thank you so much thank for talking you. us through that issue there and of course it's something that we don't often get to talk about politicians actually getting along and having a little bit of I, mirth rather I, than just the normal jabbering across the house. Cheers Tom. Coming up, we'll speak to the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, to hear what he made of the government's promise to tackle the cost of living crisis. That's after a short break. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. So Keir Starmer announced yesterday that he would resign as leader of the Labour Party if he received a fine for breaking Covid rules. He insists he didn't do so. It's a gamble. Will it pay off? Kevin Maguire, the associate editor from the Daily Mirror, joins us now. Good to see you, Kevin. And you, Gloria. Um, so Starmer said he would quit if the police fine him. Some say it's a politician with integrity. Others say it's the politician who is putting Durham police under unfair political pressure to exonerate him. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think on the question of uh, putting the police under unfair pressure, well, what about the Conservative MP Richard Holden, who wrote wanting an inquiry? What about the Cabinet Ministers demanding an inquiry? What about the Daily Mail demanding an inquiry? Have they all put uh, Durham Police under unfair pressure? I don't think so. I, I don't find that actually washes. I think the police can be pretty independent, uh, as the Prime Minister found out in London. The question of uh, in integrity and honour, I think it's part principle, it's part pragmatic, because there is no doubt that if Keir Starmer was investigated, found to have breached the laws and been fined, he would have been under intense pressure to step down as Labour leader after he made uh, such a, a great uh, cause of the Prime Minister being fined. And it equally applies to Angela Rayner, because she too has said the Prime Minister should resign. But at the same time, it is quite refreshing. <laughs> to see a, a politician put their career on the line, because he can't be absolutely certain that he'll be cleared. Uh, I believe he will be. I've looked at the law and the rules and the activities. It's very different to a birthday cake and the interior decorator being present uh, in Downing Street to celebrate the, the Prime Minister's birthday. Um, but he's, he's, he has taken a chance. And if he is cleared, his position is going to be tra contrasted very sharply to that of the Prime Minister, who's the first in office to actually be found to have broken the law when he clings on a number 10, despite the fact that a minority of Tory MPs uh, think he should go. There are those that point out that both Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer both said they took a break from work to eat and drink and then both went back to work. If they are equals, then it, it, he could get a fine, couldn't he? Yeah, well, the events would have to be equal under the, under the same uh, the same laws. I don't think they are because yes, he, you can see people eating curry. There he is swigging his uh, you know famous bottle of beer. Mary Foy, the local MP, is there the bottom left in that video taken by students next uh, who were next to the miners' hall in in Durham. But at the time, there was a specific exclu uh, exclusion for campaign, and also if you were going to work. You, and eating was reasonably necessary because of the hours you were keeping, you could eat like that. While the prime ministers, at least some of them, of course, the Met are investigating a dozen parties in Downing Street, six of them of which the prime minister is believed to have attended. Some of those may be found to have been legit, but uh, we know at least um, two now uh, weren't they broke the law and one one of them included the fine for the prime minister so the events the events may not be the same which is why the outcomes be made different some people have made up their mind already on both sides of this uh, this argument and it's got to be said that for Starmer's uh, opponents he, he could give a kidney to save a life and people would accuse him of being selfish for keeping the other one to himself is uh, he's, you know, he's taken a he's taken a pretty principled brave position here we don't see many of those in, in politics, do we, Gloria? You'll know that. I did see you tweet the point um, about uh, the kidney point this morning. Um, it, it did make me smile. I've been going through lots of your tweets, in fact, this morning. Um, lots of people think today the Queen's Speech Day is a wonderful day where we show off what only Britain can do, the pomp, the ceremony. I don't think you're a fan. No, I'm not. I think it's a load of nonsense. <laughs> I mean, look, you've got you've got a hereditary prince in a Ruritanian fancy dress jacket sitting on a golden throne in the unelected chamber in Parliament announcing what, what the government's going to go do for Britain. I mean, it looks ridiculous. I think to the rest of the world, look, we're we're a modern democracy. We're not Disney World. I mean, that's why I think it is it is utterly crazy. No, I'm I'm, I'm no royalist. Um, I am a I'm a Republican, but I've got to say I think Prince Andrew and uh, Prince Harry are doing far more to destroy the royal family than the likes of me. Will I going to ever be able to do? It's been destroyed from the inside. Interesting. In terms of the content of that speech, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's plenty that will 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 please voters. Tough on disruptive protesters, making more of Brexit opportunities, levelling up the country. Uh, it could be a, a reset moment for the government, couldn't it? Yeah, possibly, um, but does it really address the cost of living crisis, which is the major political issue for and economic issue for most families? It doesn't really. And then you have to go through the proposals. I think levelling and levelling up is still mainly uh, a slogan. 
Uh, you look at the banning the, the right of protest, or some people to uh, protest now, of course, Extinction Rebellion and uh, Insular Britain are very unpopular at the moment, but if you ban them, you might ban your own protest. If you're going to have an incinerator or a waste tip built next to you, so it can apply to you. So you can ban what you don't like, but it can boomerang and ban uh, what you would like to, to protest against. So this is going to be pretty tricky. I think it's more notable, actually, for what it for what it lacks that speech for instance if you're an animal rights uh campaigner where is that ban on foie gras and fur imports which brexit was said to be uh, making possible uh, there is no employment bill to strengthen uh, workers rights in the uk which are still weak by industrial standards so uh, I, I didn't get a real sense of a, a buzz around it. Uh, I think it felt more like a prime minister who isn't quite sure where he's going uh, at the moment, but you know, cost of living is a big issue. It doesn't really address that. Now, you could argue, Gloria, it wasn't really intended to, but the fact is it it hasn't, it just hasn't got that fizz, that pizzazz. Is it really going to transform Britain, make people's lives appreciably better? I don't think and so. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about with our next guest, Jonathan Ash Ashworth. But Kevin Maguire, Associate Editor of The Mirror, it's always good to get your take on events. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Prices are rising. The cost of living crisis is getting worse, according to a recent survey on the nation's food. More than two million adults in the UK can't afford to have a meal every day. Joining me to talk about this is Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Jonathan, what's going on here? Who are the people most likely to not be able to eat in this country? Well, we've got ever lengthening queues at food banks, the length and breadth of the country, increasing numbers of people who are in work. They're doing what they were told was the right thing. They're going to work, but they're literally forced with choices between feeding their meters or feeding their children. More and more pensioners are turning up at food banks. And for pensioners who have, they feel think this is about pride, that's very difficult for them to ask, often can be very difficult for them to ask for handouts. And I think when you uh, compare what's happening across the country with the desperate need and hardship with what we've heard today, it's thin gruel from Boris Johnson. If you're a pensioner, you've just had the biggest real terms cut in your pension for 50 years under the Tories. You've got pensioners staying on the bus all day to keep warm because they can't afford the energy bills. You've got people in families in work who've seen their universal credit cut, who are, see, who are paying more tax, who can't afford the increase in the cost of petrol, the, the increase in the prices of food in the shops turning to food banks. We should have had action today. We should have had an emergency budget to support people and help people through this crisis. I'm afraid all we've got is proof yet again that Boris Johnson's got no answers. Although um, we read in today's Sun newspaper that they are going to do more to help. Now, of course, it's not sourced. It is a story uh, by a journalist, not a government announcement. But the speculation is that more help is on the way. He might reduce VAT on fuel or make the £200 energy bill uh, a grant rather than a loan or bring forward by a year the income tax cut. So it sounds like they are going to get help on the way? Well, the proof of the pudding is in the announcements today. They've just set out their programme for government and their programme for government is Fred Bear. The cupboard is empty, uh, almost as empty as the cupboards in, in kitchens a length and breadth of the country, frankly. If Boris Johnson was going to give people that real help now, the people who are struggling with their bills, those pensioners who have seen their pension cuts, He'd have brought forward emergency measures today in his Queen's speech. He's failed to do that. And I'm just absolutely uh, so worried about our pensioners who are... I mean, I, I've heard stories of pensioners picking up blankets from food banks because they can't afford the heating bills because Boris Johnson has cut the pension by so much. He promised he would keep the triple lock. He said that at the general election, and he broke that promise. So uh, he could have taken action today, and I think it proves, once again, he's got no answers to this cost of living crisis. There will be things in the Queen's speech that people will like. Getting tough on protesters who cause disruption to us, making more of the Brexit opportunities, more on levelling up. Some good stuff there. But we've heard, we've heard these big promises before, haven't we? They keep telling us they're going to level up, while at the same time cutting back the investment that goes into communities across the country. And you can't level up unless you're investing in our schools and giving our children the 
best possible start in life. They've shut short star centres across the country. And fundamentally, where is the levelling up if people's pay packets are stretched further and further and further and they literally cannot afford to go and spend in their local shops and in their local town centres? If you want to level up this country, you've got to support people by investing in good, well-paid jobs, by not cutting things like universal credit, but by giving people support, and not hammering pensioners like Boris Johnson has done. He's betrayed pensioners by breaking the triple lock and imposing that very big swinging cut in the state pension. So there can be no levelling up while this is happening and there's no action on the cost of living. Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, thanks for your time today. Thank you. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria Pierre. I'm back every Monday to Thursday from noon. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. That is after your weather. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. The weather front that brought wet weather to Scotland and Northern Ireland yesterday is now clearing the southeast. Sunny spells replaces it, but uh, there'll be further showers, especially for northern parts of the UK with low pressure close to the north of Scotland. And a uh, weather front later will bring some more persistent rain to western Scotland. But for the time being, this uh, initial weather front is clearing East Anglia in the southeast. A much weaker affair compared to the uh, wet weather that it brought yesterday. Uh, really, it's just an area of low cloud as it uh, pushes through the southeast and a few light outbreaks of rain. Clearing by mid afternoon, sunny spells then for many. A bit blustery, especially uh, for northern parts of the UK, a cool breeze. Still some warmth in the south, but uh, showers will keep going for northern England, for parts of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, some heavy downpours, and more persistent rain coming along for western and northern Scotland, for parts of Northern Ireland uh, during the night time. Further south, the cloud builds and some rain arrives into Wales in the southwest by dawn. Mild here, 11 or 12 Celsius. 8 or 9 for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. And it's a bright start for Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England as well, seeing a few breaks in the cloud, but further showers coming along for the northern half of the UK. Meanwhile, wet weather extends across much of the southern half of the UK, especially the Midlands into South and East Wales, as well as the South West. Feeling cool as that rain sets in. Quite an unpleasant day, but the rain useful for gardens and farms, I'm sure. However, the southeast avoiding most of the rain until much later. Feeling warm here, 20 or 21 Celsius ahead of the rain. And then that rain pushes into the southeast during Wednesday evening, eventually clearing overnight. Clear spells follow elsewhere. And then Thursday, Friday, both quite similar days with a lot of cloud in the north and some showery rain, drier further south, and then most places fine this weekend. I'm Liam Halligan. Join me every weekday at 1 p.m. for On The Money, your daily dose of economics, business and consumer news. I've got 25 years experience covering economics and finance. We hold grown up discussions with a host of experts who really know their stuff. We can't buy gas and store it. That was a mistake, wasn't it? I think it was a mistake. Even you, Liam, don't have a crystal ball. Inflation's a real threat. Every weekday at 1, you're on the money. My name's Tom Harwood and every weekday we bring you The Briefing live from 9.30am. The stories, analysis and live debate that you need to hear. Quite right, uh, uh, Tom, of, of course. Was this something that has been considered at all? Difficult to answer. Gas guzzling helicopters circling. Noise is being made here. Joe Biden walking out. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, Monday to Friday, 9.30am on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when